Welcome back to the Welsh History Podcast, episode 43, Being a King in Wales. Last week, we talked about how kinship influenced the concepts of the head of the family and created kings in waiting. This week, we are going to talk about how these family heads, strong men, military leaders, and others, became the kings of the medieval period. The idea of nobility and leadership is one of, that has always fascinated people. How does one go from being a local strong man or woman to being one considered appointed by God or gods to sit in the seat of power? With the Welsh kings, our first place to start, unsurprisingly, is with Rome. While the kings of the no Old North, between York, known as Elmet in the Old British tradition, and southern Scotland, kept their kings, the former Britons in Wales had not had a king or a chief since the second century. Because of this, what came next was modeled initially on Rome. The Welsh kings began around the basis of Roman administration of the Civitas. These civic towns with their old provincial roads and levers of power were able to express control of the local and surrounding areas and became key points in the establishment of, for example, Gwent in the old Silures land and Gwyneth, the old stomping ground of the Ordovis, among others. However, last week we pointed out that Wales was becoming much more rural. Roman roads and buildings and societies had broken down, and the new inheritors of the Welsh were unable to keep their old ways. In these new micro-kingdoms, the old ways vanished. We can see that about last couple of weeks, as we were talking about Christianity before this and kinship last week, there is this sense that there is a separation between the old and the new, and that the rural nature of Wales, which had existed before, was returning and was strengthening in a way. Micro-kings, sub-kings, or whatever you want to call these strong men, would conglomerate in the north and west around the strong central figures controlling approximately the equivalent kingdoms to their Saxon neighbors to the east in the 6th and 7th centuries. Mercia, Northumbria, uh, Wessex, and those areas all were sort of similar size to Gwyneth, Powys, and Dyfed in the west. Uh, in the southeast of Wales, however, this was not the case. Here, kings continued to control what be, would be considered tiny areas and fight over and over again with rivals in the, up until the 9th century over little more than glorified civatas. Where Gwyneth had grown into a Welsh power, Gwent and its fellow kingdoms continued to squabble over smaller and smaller portions. These were distinguished in Wales by their titles. The king of Dyfed or Doithbarth, and Gwyneth were... Arbenin, Arbenining kings, or principal kings. In a way, the sub-kings were more like the lords in the English and Norman system, where fealty was due to the lord, who then owed it to his king. Just like that, the sub-kings of Wales owed it to their principal king, who might also owe his fealty to a Gwalad, or over-king. Gwalad, in modern Welsh, refers to country, but Professor Charles Edwards says in early Wales this also meant this was also considered a double meaning, which it could also mean overlord or high king. This may have come about because of the Irish influence in Wales, particularly in the west and the north, where a similar term meant country, kingdom, and king all at once. These high kings were rare, but there were times when a high king ruled over the rest. This feels very much like the systems of king kinship where the heads of the family would rule and judge over the others. In effect, the sub-kings were like the cousins, who would take their dispute to the Penkinetal to decide the outcome. The Penkinetal, in this case, of course, would be the high king or the principal king. Of course, loyalty was not necessarily as familial, so it might be more flexible than it should or probably would have been in a family environment. Much has been made in other episodes about how the British inherited the Roman ways of doing things and expectations. This is no different in the leaders. Where in Saxon and Angle lands, the leaders were called king, or kinning, which was the root of the Proto-Germanic, which has roots in the Proto-Germanic word kineges 
for leader or supreme leader of the people. In Wales, the Roman term princeps was still the common word which originated with Augustus, who used the Latin term which meant first man or first in line, as opposed to king, rex. It was a title which was in favor because of that until the late 3rd century when emperor, or imperator, became the term for the leader of the Roman people. Imperator before that was strictly a military term uh, and mostly meant uh, the leader of the military. It would, as I said, later become synonymous with the emperor. In Wales, princeps, or prince, was to be continued for some use and would show up in full force around the 12th century when Owen Gwyneth and Rhys ap Gruffydd took the title for themselves. It makes sense if we look at the Arbigning, which, was, which had similarities to the princeps in definition. There is a strong link to the concept of a, that a prince, rather than being an underling or a descendant of a current king, is instead a higher position than a simple king. He is the principal king, or prince, and or princeps, to use the Latin term. Of course, there are other titles for sub-kings, as in the ri, which was taken from the Latin rex, which is now synonymous with king. And of course, there's also brennan, a strictly Welsh word that refers back to high king and may be related to the Welsh term brant, for one with special status. Uh, again, going back to Professor Charles Edwards, who I lean heavily on for this topic, uh, he felt that this term was purely a Welsh idea and had come likely at the very latest in the early medieval period and may even harken back farther than that. The link with Rome would see princeps as a better title and already associated with overlordship. This could also have had links to past Roman, pre-Roman leadership where the tribes were interlinked, but that is speculation based on the concept of a high king, which leads in battles against the Romans, according to Tacitus, amongst others. Obviously, if you go back to old Roman sources, they talked about the fact that there were kings and chiefs and that there was high kings. But how true this was, or whether this was just the understanding of the Romans and trying to define what that leadership was like, possibly we could be seeing a Brennan in some form at this point even. And maybe that term is actually a lot older than what we think, simply because it may have existed before then. And of course, you have people like Tacitus and Suetonius, to a lesser extent, talking about these things. If this was a historical cultural setup for the British leadership going back in the midst of prehistory, it, be it becomes both more understandable and more dangerous. The problems set in motion by the kingship, by the kinship rules, likely also harken back to prehistory and shows that groups can either go from strength to strength or to disaster depending on the family unity. Without unity, these groups collapse, and likely this may have been something that the Romans, the Saxons, and the Normans took advantage of throughout Welsh history. In fact, we can point out quite clearly that during the period of Edward I, this was the case. He took a lot of advantage of the fact that these kings didn't always love giving fealty to other kings and slowly whittled away the Welsh independence because of that particular idea. Uh, if we look at modern federations as an example in Australia, in Canada, in the United States, amongst others, uh, we have sub-governments that are subordinate to the national government. These states or provinces own loyalty to the national government. When they are working in unity, they can make societies work very well. But when they conflict, they can create massive problems up to and including wars, revolutions, and unrest. All we have to do is look at the U.S. Civil War, or even to a lesser extent, the English Civil War is an example of this, where sub-governments or sub-strata of leadership were unhappy with how the current leader was, was managing things for obviously very different reasons across history. And they revolted from that problem through that issue. So Wales, for example, was made up of various subordinate governments with shifting loyalties, shifting links, and in the end, shifting sizes and abilities to survive. Compound that with the largely rural and most likely poorer population and the ever-growing Saxon population, and their massive wealth gained from the victories over the Welsh and their allies, it is obvious that the conflict and quarrels would be the price for this lack of unity. One could argue that Wales only ever truly united as a country under one leader when he was the child of a Norman rule 
and that was Owen Glyndwr. The reality is, as we look at this strategy and this tactical idea of creating kinships and then transfer it into kings and try and talk about it from that level, it is much more difficult. And it's, as I said earlier, the idea that you would go back into a loyalty with your high king or your principal king and be responsible to them when you don't have a familial link. Of course, kings and, and princes and all that have links that they create with each other through intermarriage, through alliances and things. And so to a degree, you do have a familial link. But the reality of it is, is, is it's probably not as tight as it would be, for example, if it was your brother or if it was your son or if it was your mother or your father or, your, you know, all of these relationships create a much tighter circumstance. And we know from our own experience that just because you have a familial link with someone, it doesn't immediately make it that you're going to be loyal to them. There are plenty of cases where that is very much not the case. However, what we can point to and what we can say is that we see that these people had created sort of this federation of kingdoms. And when they worked together and when they fought together and when they worked as a group, then they worked well. They were able to defeat the English, defeat the Saxons, defeat, to a lesser extent, the Normans in these circumstances. But more often than not, they didn't work well together. The, the whole idea that you create these minor kingdoms which are supposed to be responsible to you, and yet they have a level of power which gives them control over their own military, their own money, their own destiny, effectively, it's very difficult to suddenly turn around and say, hey, you know, you owe me loyalty, unless you can prove by force that you can control that loyalty. And so we see at times where in the ninth century, as an example, you have kings in South Wales, especially, turning to Alfred, of all people, to be their support and their help in the defense against the northern kingdoms who were effectively trying to put them under their thumb to make them proper sub-kingdoms. And it will create this split within Wales, which I think never really gets healed in the kingdom eras. The idea that the southern kingdoms, in effect, felt more loyalty and more unity with the Saxons than they did with, the, with their own Welsh uh, leadership in other countries and other nations is certainly something of a concern. And of course, this is not a blanket statement either. I mean, there are obviously times when loyalties flip back and forward. But the reality of it is, if you're looking at this from a purely Welsh perspective, it doesn't help you much to try and unite your kingdom when part of your kingdom or part of your, your country continues to flip back and forward between you and the powerful neighbor to the east and the west, or the east and the south. The idea that you could create a kingdom based on this lack of unity and have this constant problem of descendancy where everybody gets a level playing field right down to your great-grandchild, it, it's, a, it's a recipe for continued problems, for continued divisions, for continued issues, and it creates in and of itself more and more trouble than I think it ends up being worth. And unfortunately, I, th I, th one of the reasons why I've spent basically two episodes talking about this is I think this is the key problem that the Welsh have in their, in what will be their battles against the Saxons, and against the Normans and the English on a whole. They just don't have that unity until after their own independence is taken away, and after the fact they create that unity and for a while create their own country for a good ten years. This concept in this problem we'll come back to quite often. And one could argue that part of the problem is the influence of other nations on those areas, whereas the southeast was heavily influenced by the Romans, was heavily influenced by Saxon neighbors. We don't have that in the west. In the west and in the far north, for the most part, they're separate. Their problem, as I mentioned before, in the 5th and the 4th centuries, were more built around the Irish. And so their, their concepts, understandings, and way of life is built around the Irish influence. And so you have this whole 
division beginning right from the get-go, and it continues for many, many years after this, and will effectively come to a head with Oeng Glyndur, who will then try and unite the country into one country, and then use the power of that country to try and create an international uh, power that could actually call for help, create massive alliances with major powers, and try and become something of a recognized independent state, something their Scottish uh, allies and brothers had done in the past before them. And so we can see that this continual issue of disunity will create this problem. And yes, one could argue that the same thing went with the Saxons until the Normans invaded. If we look at the Saxons, the Heptarchy, or the, or the few countries that, who control all of England, uh, battled and conflicted with one another to the point where they were weak enough that the, when the Vikings invaded, there was no sense of unity, no sense of desire to work together, until effectively there was very few of them left, and the one powerhouse that was still left, uh, Wessex, or the West Saxons, ended up becoming the true power in England and eventually the, her the hereditary king of England. This came about, as I said, by force, effectively. It didn't come about and came about from outside and inside pressure. This is the kind of thing that doesn't initially happen in Wales. I wonder, actually, honestly, is if the Welsh had more problems with the Vikings if they had actually been able to unify because of the outward threat, if that would have created a much stronger base of operations for them and created a situation where there became a one prince or one king of Wales who would then dominate and control everything. We obviously don't see that happening and, and we'll go very heavily into, in the, over the next few weeks, the wars between the Saxons, the Vikings, the the Welsh and both in and out of Wales and their allies and sometimes enemies and how that influenced what went on. I mean, Mercia is an ally of Gwyneth at times and an enemy at times. The Northumbrians are enemies and allies. The Saxons in the south and the west also have alliances that they create with the Welsh in different areas. Dyfeth and Duthbarth and, and Glywysing and Gwent and Powys are all heavily influenced by their links to the Saxon peoples on their borders and the influence that they have over them and will conflict with and ally with them on different occasions. And we've been lucky enough in some cases that there's a better historical record about all this. Of course, it's it, it's layered in mythology and it's layered in storytelling as well as layered in history, so we have to be careful. But we will have an opportunity to talk more in depth about all this. And as we go further and we start to move into the 7th and 8th centuries, we'll have a much firmer footing for the, all of this. I think we'll be able to talk about how kings in Britain fought against each other and how they worked together and, and what alliances were made up. And, and why they came about. And certainly the sources I have to hand become a lot denser at this point. So I, I think we're, we're going to have a little bit more of a firmer foundation. But even within that great story of the politics and the military and the wars and, the, and strategic thinking and ideas and cultural influences, we're also going to talk a little bit more local level and lower level if we can and continue to bring in some of the archaeology, some of the other layers to all of this. And as we go, so you can understand, this is why I wanted to discuss kingship and what it meant in Wales, so that you knew going forward that this is what we're talking about, that Welsh kings are not the same as English kings. They don't define themselves in the same way, and they don't entitle themselves the same, and don't model themselves after the English. The Saxons have very different ideas about what a king is, about what allegiance is to a king, and how it works. And it won't be until the Norman invasions under Edward I and the domination of the Plantagenets over Wales 
that we get a split from this period. And what comes next, the Owen Glyndor period specifically, has no relationship to what went on in the past in and of the fact that he is not working from a purely Welsh perspective. He is working from a purely Norman perspective with a Welsh twist. And we will talk about that further. We'll get into this as we as we go along, as I always say. And uh, I, I'm very intrigued to continue to talk about that. I, I it's a it's a fascinating topic. But like I said, also I want to talk about some of the other things that are happening at this time and how it's influencing the Welsh because there's a lot of micro level things that are also changing. The language is changing as well, and we do need to talk about that. We've talked a bit about Brythonic. We need to talk about more about Welsh and how it diverges yet again from Brythonic and becomes much more the language that we know today as opposed to the one in the past. So, with all that said and done, I hope you've enjoyed this particular episode. If you have, if you have comments, if you have concerns, please contact me at the Welsh History Podcast at gmail.com. If you could please give us a rating and a review on iTunes, that's really, really helpful. It allows others to find us easier. And the more people that do, the better off it is for for me anyway. But it also helps you when you're talking to others about this podcast and about what we are doing here as well. One of the things that was suggested to me and I wanted to quickly bring up is an idea of having a Q&A session episode where I answer some of your questions to the best of my ability. So if you want to ask questions about Welsh history, if you want to ask questions, hopefully I have answers to. Uh, If you want to ask questions about myself or about the podcast or about podcasting or any sort of question you might have, please do so to the email welshhistorypodcast at gmail.com and possibly in April or May, we'll look at having an episode where we talk about these things and hopefully answer your questions. Until next time, everyone, have a great day. We'll talk to you all later. And... Once again, you can find everything we do on this network at distractionsmedia.com. Thanks, everyone. Bye. This has been a Distractions Media production. For more information, you can check out everything we do at distractionsmedia.com.